Hello, everyone, and welcome, welcome to Turn 2, the podcast where we discuss everything Hearthstone. Charber here, as usual, with two awesome guests. This week, we do have Dark and Powder from Team iHeartU, so we'll just do quick introductions for our viewers. Uh, we'll go Dart and then Powder, so why don't you kick us off, Dart? Uh, sure. Thanks for having me. Um, I guess everyone knows me as Dart. My name's Matt Argel. Um been playing Hearthstone for way too long, back in closed beta before the even ranking system existed. Uh, and yeah, I've been Legend, I think every single season, usually top 10. And I do as many tournaments as I can, and I guess I do all right. Your turn, Powder. Awesome, awesome, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, my name is Harold Jimray. Most people know me as Powder. I play uh, at IRSU right now. Um, Basically the same thing. Been playing Hearthstone for as long as I can rem remember, almost no, <laughs> since it came out. Basically, um, been playing tournaments uh, for a long time and been doing all right as well. Awesome. Yeah, good to hear. Yeah, glad to have both of you guys here this week to discuss some things. Uh, you know, I was prepping this week's, and in the beginning, I was like, oh, I guess this week's been a little bit quiet for Hearthstone. But then we did actually have quite a few announcements on, on the esports side, at the very least. I think, of course, the quiet thing partly because the last month we've had GVG come out and then everyone's just been on the GVG hype train trying new things, talking about what could be the most, you know, the craziest thing that could happen. But how how have you guys been enjoying GVG? Uh, I'm oh, sorry, you... go ahead, Powder. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll start. I mean, GVG has kind of just flipped everything upside down and, like, that's probably what everyone said like every time but it's true like it's a it's good with the change and it seems like every deck is playable now and it's a lot of fun with new cards like new paladin cards especially which i've been playing a lot of and uh i mean it's just a lot of fun just messing around with everything yeah i'm kind of the same way it's i, I love that there's new cards but like you said that everything is viable now that's what's actually been frustrating for me it's there's no meta shifts like there used to be where all of a sudden it's all the same deck and you could quickly counter it counter it, counter it and it always was shifting now it's just every deck can beat almost everything so it's just kind of a major uh cluster of just decks going through ladder which is for me has been kind of annoying but otherwise i, I just love some of the new cards yeah, that's very true. You know, uh, I myself have noticed that a little bit uh, that on ladder at the very least, right? Like you said, Dart, in the past, you'd be like, okay, well, you know, at least maybe even day to day. Today, everyone seems to be playing Control Warrior, so I'll just play something to try to beat that or something like that. But then myself, I'm like, oh, you know, I ran into like a couple of Zoo decks, so I'll, I'll change my deck up. And then I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'm playing Control Warriors now. And then I switch back. It's like, I guess I'm back to Zoo. And it's just, you, you never know who you're going to expect on, on ladder anymore just because of the viability of all these different decks. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, now, some would argue, of course, that that leads to maybe maybe healthier things. Of course, it's still only be a month, uh, so we'll see if things kind of stabilize. I think people will find out favorite matchups, and we're still seeing slight tweaks, right? I mean, for instance, Mech Mage originally posted up by uh, Kibler, and then we saw Strife Crow kind of innovating that for the King Gwyn Invitational, and now we're seeing different variations. Um, so what do you think about the tweaking and kind of the checking that's going on, especially among players, uh, professional players? I mean, there's always new cards, and uh, you can, you can like, tech into all the different decks there are. Uh, and there's always going to be new cards coming coming forward that are amazing, and it's always, it's just good for, good for everyone out there just to try new stuff and... Eventually, you're going to be the one with the new best deck that no one knows about, and you're going to win a bunch of tournaments. <laughs> That's, I completely agree with that. It's just because of how GBG is right now, um, like I said, where every deck is pretty consistent, sometimes someone will invent a deck that just demolishes the meta. It obviously hasn't happened yet. I've tried it a few times. It worked for about a week, and then a whole new set of decks have just been created, so... It's it, it'll be a while to stabilize, but at some point someone will take over. Yeah, uh, that's definitely happened in the past, right? Closed beta kind of, we had some favored matchups, but it, it went on for a little bit until people started coming up with uh, the things we know now as archetypes, right? Like ramp druid and then control warrior. So those come out uh, to perfection. It took a little while uh, as we waited, so I think we'll take a little bit more time for GVG to settle down now. Uh, of course, you know, there's not 
too much to discuss about GVG anymore. It's been out for a month. Uh, there hasn't been any you know crazy patches or even crazy decks like you guys mentioned. Uh, but I think one thing I do want to also touch upon is, do you think there uh, enough cards from kind of the original set, the classic set, have actually gotten their power back because of new cards? Or is it really just uh, the GVG cards taking some tech places uh, in the classic archetypes we had before? I mean, I haven't really seen anything, any card that I can remember um, from the old, old, old cards mm -hmm. that have come back and just like completely dominated. Uh, there's, I don't think there's a card that I can actually just like on the off the top of my head just like say, oh, that card has become amazing again. Um, As you're actually talking, I'm taking a look at my decks to see, and the one that comes to mind right now is Big Game Hunter. It is so much more prevalent in every single deck than it used to be. I think particularly because of how good Dr. Boom is. Yeah, I think, and, and people were predicting that, that Dr. Boom, uh, of course in the beginning some people were like not sure if this card is going to be good. Uh, it got a huge just following, I guess, among the community where everyone was putting it into every deck. And then people are like, you know what this is going to do? It's going to bring Big Game Hunter and actually lead into maybe uh, Handlocks having a harder time, especially on Ladder, because pretty much everyone's going to want to run at least one Big Game Hunter. Um, and yeah, and exactly. Another one I would think of is Jaraxxus. Now, not because of the GVG cards, but because since Leroy has been nerfed, um, Handlock kind of shot up. Hunter has kind of lost a little bit of their viability since then. And now the meta slowed down a bit. Jaraxxus has just been popping up Every, in every handlock deck I've ever seen in a tournament and ladder, which used to not be so. Very also true. Yeah, handlock, especially in the first week of GVG, handlock was kind of the one that everyone thought got so much more powerful. Of course, now we're seeing that there is a little bit more of a balance there, a shifting between classes. But the first week with the Dark Bomb coming out, and then like you said, other decks being a little bit slower, the Lord Jaraxxus along with the handlock type uh, deck type coming back strong. Here in the first month of GVG. Now, you know, for GVG, again, I I can't really think of anything else that's been too crazy. I mean, have you guys run into any deck lists that, even if it sounds a little bit out of the norm, that you think maybe it's something that people should keep an eye on, or something that you've come up with that you think definitely has a shot at becoming uh, a big deck? <laughs> I'm going to take the silence as, as a no. It's like, uh, you know, um, is there really anything... <laughs> I don't know. I've had one deck, um, this Paladin deck I have that I is not really. It's pretty standard, but with just a few changes that I took from rank five to like top ten legend with like three losses. But but that, like I said, it's not the thing that it's can demolish the entire meta. It's right. every game I played was very close. Um, it has really no bad matchups. But at this, I can probably say the same thing um, with the hunter that we just saw Caldy uh, kind of destroy the Yud with four zero there. It's has a couple matchups that are iffy, but the rest it kind of beats. So I mean, because of that kind of dichotomy between all the decks right now, <laughs> I don't think there's anything that just stands out as dominant. I really like the um, the Echo of Meredith Mages. I mean, it's like it's not something that's new. It's been around for a bit right now, but it's still something that's very new to Hearthstone, as that card is very very different from anything we had before. Um, and it's a very cool interaction with how it plays. Um, that's a card I really like. I haven't really created any decks that are amazing and stuff like that. I haven't actually played with the card that much. Um, but that's one of the cards I think creates decks that are very, very different and fun to play. Mm -hmm. I was yeah, actually talking true. with uh, Strike Pro a bit the other day. I was watching him play um, just through spectator mode. He wasn't really streaming it some interesting Echo of Medivh mages, and we were both trying to figure out some combo between the Fatigue mage that kind of Freshka made Sabij popularize a bit, and then some of the control mages that Strife Pro somehow always pulls out of nowhere that dominate tournaments. Um, I, I feel like at some point there will be some kind of deck that involves a slow controlly mage with Echo of just because it kind of has the option to either fatigue an opponent or take board control and kind of just dominate them in the mid game. But again, it's going to take a lot of practicing from a lot of the good players to really figure one out. 
All right. And, you know, actually, just now I'm picking up, uh, let's just jump right into esports because I'm ju just reading about the kind of details outlined uh, about the 2015 Hearthstone World Championship coming up. And so far, it looks all similar. Now, one thing I do want to mention, you know, it's going to be 16 players at uh, the final, the World Championship taking place uh, at the end of the year. Uh, and it's going to be four regions. Now, the one thing I kind of want to ask you guys about and what your thoughts are, if you if you maybe even have any exposure to these, is the fourth region that was kind of mentioned as Korea, Taiwan in, uh, in 2014. Now, they're changing it to Asia Pacific to include not just those two regions, but Southeast Asia as a whole, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan. Uh, what do you think about kind of just expanding this right away to these new regions? Do you think it's because we've seen enough following from Hearthstone from these regions in general, or it's just that Blizzard kind of wants to keep it open uh, from the get-go? Wait, did you, mean, did you say the Hearthstone World Championship was just announced? Let me take a quick look at this. Yeah, yeah, so uh, the details were just outlined. Of course, the, you know, they were saying, of course, it's going to continue 2015 and whatnot. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me let me put the link in here for everyone so we can check it out together. Uh, but... I love this because the live feed just coming in. Now, otherwise, you know, it's going to be points leading up to regional qualifiers, the regional championships then going to take place. And I think that's all the same. I think not many people will have qualms with that as we go through because um, that's what we saw in 2014. And it was pretty mm -hmm. straightforward. But the one thing, again, that I want to bring up is kind of the expansion of the fourth region uh, I, I just say fourth because we're seeing the three biggest ones we're looking at the americas and then we're looking at um of course china and europe those are the three biggest regions and we saw them last year and last year then we had korea taiwan be grouped as one region now we're expanding that to include southeast asia australia new zealand and japan so calling it asia pacific and it just strikes me as interesting because again hearthstone is only one like technically one year old uh, as a game after full release and it's only had that one world championship. And already we're seeing a huge boom. And we saw that throughout 2014. But to officially include these regions, especially regions that don't often get exposure in other esports, I think is a big move uh, and kind of a big note about Hearthstone's popularity uh, worldwide. What do you guys think? I know that it has a quite a big following in Japan just because D2 uh, from our team, he plays there. And he's right. always said that it's, it's quite big. Um, I also know that Australia is a like it's quite big of an like esports country. I mean Australia is huge and uh, I mean there's a lot of people that live there. And I know they have a lot of League of Legends players and StarCraft players and it's a pretty like big community within those. I'm not sure about Hearthstone though, but I mean I think everyone should get a chance. Uh, something that didn't happen last year at Worlds. A lot of countries didn't get a chance to even uh, take part. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I completely agree. And the person that actually comes to mind that I talked to a bit who was not happy about not being able to play in the World Championship was RDU from Romania. I'm still not yeah. sure about the rules on that country right now, but it was just a little upsetting to see someone who was so dominant in the tournament scene not even have a shot at the Blizzard World Championship. Absolutely. Now, of course, the residency requirements continuing through, you do need a proof of residency or citizenship within the region that they've outlined uh, to qualify. And yeah, again, I think for regions like Europe, uh, maybe they'll need to kind of outline some more specifics on that because there are so many different countries that have maybe different rules that's in their own about, you know, players being able to go and participate in foreign events and, you know, prize money and things like that often leads to these logistics. But you know, I'm I am really happy, and I'm you know I'm glad you mentioned you know D two of course uh, on Team IRTU, and he's you know right now in Japan, and th there's you know he can kind of give us feedback on the popularity of the game there. Australia, you know, I like that you mentioned that powder because Australia does have a lot of kind of players and interest in other esports, but again, just because of its geographical location, uh, they're always kind of hungry for more exposure. I think whether it's tournaments, mm -hmm. whether it's just teams being able to fly out to others, and to have players that might have a chance to you know travel to the 2015 world championship again they have to compete in the whole region of asia pacific but if they can i think that'd be great uh, for you know new zealand or australia where they may not get as much exposure even to local tournaments 
uh, than we see in other regions. So that's pretty exciting. I mean, already, I, I like that this announcement's coming out right now too, right? Just right from the get-go, beginning of the year, Blizzard's like, hey, we're keeping this up to date. We want to keep the esports scene growing in Hearthstone. Uh, so how do you feel about kind of the growth of esports in Hearthstone? What do you what do you think has been good and maybe what do you think can be worked on a little bit more, whether it's on the side of tournaments or players? Oh, that's a tough question. Yeah, it's uh it well it's broad for one. So we can we can go with a little bit more specifics. Let's start with um I'll kick things off here. Tournaments, right? We've had a lot, uh, especially online. Uh, Hearthstone leading itself to easier online tournaments because lag is not as much of an issue. And then, and then we've had some, you know, offline tournaments too. And we've seen different tournament formats pop up. But right now, kind of the uh, you know King of the Hill deck style, where you know you ban one, then you keep one, and then you just counter, 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 going back and forth, has grown to be the norm in most tournaments. And mm. we're already also seeing. A lot of tournaments like every week there's at least some sort of an online tournament going on uh how do you feel about tournament formats and then are we maybe seeing an early oversaturation of tournament content um i mean i think we're always gonna kind of have this tournament format because it's the easiest by far until someone says i'm gonna try this and then it works out better uh, I don't think anyone actually just wants to do something other than this because it actually works. It's a great format. Uh, Hearthstone, this is it's a good way to play Hearthstone. Banning one deck, playing a best of five, a best of seven, or whatever. Um, about like an oversaturation of tournaments, I don't know. Hearthstone is such a an accessible game that it takes like four or five hours to play a tournament with. 500 people if it's done like in a quick way it's mm. just it's just easy and everyone likes it and i mean mm. <laughs> what else is there to say <laughs> yeah I, I was gonna say i love the overabundance of tournaments not only because it's just more for us as semi-pro or even pro players like powder um but it, it allows new players to have opportunities to give just give a shot at tournaments some people might be like oh this game's pay to win there's many common cups to, or like they call common cups where you can only use common cards. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, there's a fifty dollar tournament that, for someone who is, I guess, higher in the Hearthstone scene, it's not really worth it to play five hours for for fifty dollars. But someone who wants to kind of kind of start building their name, those are perfect to start with. So I know a lot of people who really got their start there, and actually that's how I did. I started playing twenty five dollar tournaments through <laughs> yeah. this small organization. Won a few of them. Someone told me about ESL, and then I just started doing those. Right on. Yeah, definitely the, I think, the overabundance of those uh, kind of out the outside tournaments, right, where it's not going to, you know, you might have those restrictions on cards or maybe restrictions on ranks just to give people a little bit more experience. But definitely, definitely a good thing. I guess my, uh, personally, one concern I do have, but this is a concern I have for all esports is, because we can have online tournaments, right? We just keep hosting more and more tournaments, which is good for the players a lot of the times, but sometimes for viewers or especially analysts or casters, uh, sometimes you have just too much to catch up on. It's like, when do I catch all of this? And then you have to decide which ones do I watch and you start watching highlights. And the one thing uh, I've seen in other titles that can happen in the community is that sometimes the fans are like, well, you know what? Like this region, maybe not worth watching anymore unless it's like a huge tournament and then they'll skip out on a few of those and it kind of shifts the interest, uh, especially maybe given time of year. And we'll, we'll see how that pans out. Again, it's only been one year and I'm sure there's going to be many more developments and we'll see organizations also working with different schedules to make sure they accommodate each other as we go through 2015. Now, on the topic of esports, um, we had some... You know, in the past week, we've had some nice announcements coming through in the Hearthstone scene with different players and teams. Um, first, so let's talk about Archon. And Archon's kind of been in the spotlight uh, since, it's, since it was announced because, of course, of Moz kind of being a staple name in Hearthstone. He said, you know, I'm going to leave prior organizations, create my own team. And then immediately Fireback goes in and wins at the World Championship 2014. It's like, what's going on with Team Archon? And now they've expanded even more. Uh, to include uh, not just professional players anymore, but now including kind of what's been a staple in 
many esports titles to include streamers uh, under your same banner. Uh, we've seen this, of course, with TSM. Uh, we've seen it with other brands too, and now with Team Archon. Uh, what do you what do you think about this expansion? Um, I, I think it's actually a great move by uh, Moz. Um, I was actually at BlizzCon with Firebad and hanging out with the Moz and Hosty, and it's unbelievable to realize how much of business sense that a Moz has as not only a player and streamer, but now as the uh, team captain of Archon. He really understands like not only how to build a brand name, but how to turn something like streaming into an actual business, which is just... Mm very unlike a lot of other teams that I've seen formed and fall apart. Um, so I, I think he put pick up Zigzo because for anyone who really knows the scene, Zigzo is an absolute dominant force. If there's a qualifier, Zigzo wins it. There, there's no question <laughs> about that. And then for Dear Nadia, she is not only the most watched uh, female streamer in Hearthstone, she actually knows the game. It's not like she's just a random girl who plays, kind of puts a low cut shirt on, and gets thousands of viewers. She actually plays decent Hearthstone, so that kind of adds to her uh, overall stream. What about yeah, you, I think you. I think you basically covered. I mean, I think it's a. Uh, I don't. I don't really know much about why he did it, but what I know is that like when it when they first started out, I'm pretty sure uh, Amos wanted to create something where there would be like a 24 hour stream, so mm. they could kind of shift their viewers to themselves and keep their viewers within Archon, uh, nice. which is very smart. Um, I don't know exactly if that's the reasoning or why, but I mean, it's definitely a good choice to pick them up, and Sixo is an amazing player, and Nadia's stream is also very entertaining to watch, so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, having worked with Amaz a couple of times and spoken to him, he definitely has a good sense on kind of where he wants to go with branding in general for himself, for his team. And, and like you guys mentioned, Zixo, especially recently, you know, after his splash of getting number one legend on all three servers at the same time uh, for a little while there, uh, that just drew a lot even more attention to him. Not just people who followed the hardcore esports scene, but then others were like, who is this guy? You know, he's just dominating ladder. And then uh, adding, adding streamers. Now you guys both mentioned kind of, of course, dear Nadia, specifically a, a great streamer, he kind of knows what she's doing with the concept of streaming and branding herself and making that uh, her, you know, kind of job, as many have done in esports. Uh, but what do you think about that? I just, you know, turning streaming into a profession and then now these esports organizations, what used to be esports organizations, now including them to become just more of a gaming brand. Uh, where do you see this going? Um, that's <laughs> see, I don't know. For me, is I'm actually not a streamer. Unfortunately, I don't have time because I'm in medical school. But mm -hmm. it's always interesting to watch um, some of the best like players and streamers. Uh, Firebat's a good example. The people he practices with, most of them don't stream. Um, and he would agree with me that some of the best players in Hearthstone, no one has ever heard about. Mm. Uh, but that's why no one hears about them. It's the, I feel like the basis of, of Hearthstone as an eSport is the stream aspect of it. And that could be good or bad, depending on how you look at it. Yeah, I, I, can, I kind of agree. Um, I mean, a lot, of the, a lot of people don't have an ability to stream. Like, I'm one of those people, like, my computer isn't good enough or my internet isn't good enough. And that's the reason, like, that's a big reason for a lot of people. And, uh, and even if you do stream, like you might get 10 viewers, you might get 15 viewers, and that doesn't change anything. Then it's basically as you're not streaming, um, people are still just going to watch uh, Amaz or Forsen or someone like that because they know what they're doing. They're in, and very entertaining to watch, and it's very hard for you to compete with them because they've already built your name, and they're very good at doing what they're doing. Um, which is kind of a problem, uh, I think, but it's yeah. not something you can change. I mean, you can't tell them to get worse at streaming or <laughs> stop, but I mean, <laughs> yeah, just go to them and be like, Hey, can you like stop streaming so that I can get some airtime? <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
And, and it adds yeah. to like having contacts that are big streamers. Really, the best way to get a stream started is to have uh, people who are already popular host you, which is one of Twitch's new features. Um, it's a great way to get off the ground and kind of advertise each other. It seems like all the big streamers, when they're done, they just send everyone to another stream. It just makes the transition a little bit easier, which I like that they implemented. Yeah, and you know, even before Twitch implemented that, we've seen players kind of say, "Hey, well, you know, I'm done stream, but this guy, like, he's a he's a rising name. I think they're going to be good, or you know, she's doing great in arena. You should go check her stream out." And then you just send them over. Now, with the hosting system, like you said, you don't even have to go through that hassle. You can tell them, but you can also just host it on your channel and kind of share the exposure, which I think is great. So, props to Twitch for that. Now we had uh, we also had a different announcement. Uh, coming out a few days earlier, of course, with another team coming up. And now this kind of ties into the discussion we had about Archon and about kind of teams trying to brand themselves and grow a little bit more. And we're talking about the team with RDU, uh, Thais, Life Coach, and Lothar, Team Nihilum. And now, of course, Nihilum has been a name before this, right? It's not just like Archon where it's been grown mm -hmm. uh, from the ground up. But uh, what do you think about this team, first of all, the lineup? Um, first of all, I want to quickly point something out that I think is a little bit funny. Uh, the last time I was on turn two, what, six, eight months ago, we were also talking about Firebat and Life Coach, but it was about a different team when I was actually on the team with them. <laughs> so interesting timing, but <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm actually happy for obviously both of them. They're both moving on to bigger and greater things. Um, but I love Nihilum's, Nihilum, is that how you pronounce it? Um, I'm actually but, not positive on the pronunciation. <laughs> But their lineup is great. Um, I, I think it was one of the first yep. teams that actually picked a group of players not based on their stream numbers. Um, Life Coach is really the only big streamer of them. RDU gets a decent amount of viewers, but not exceptional. And same with Tice. Um, but the the players themselves are exceptional. Tice is amazing when it comes to tournaments. RDU has had a bad string of luck recently, I think. But he's a player who really tries to prepare as much as possible for every tournament. And then you have Life Coach, who creates the craziest decks of all time and somehow wins with them, both on ladder and in tournaments. So I think it'll be a great team in the future. Yeah, and Thais and RDU have obviously worked well together at Meet Your Makers before, and they know how how both of them work to get, like how to work together and stuff like that. So it can only be a good thing as well. Right now, um, in the interview they have with Ghosty Gamers here, Lothar was talking about, you know, they're going to, they want to keep the lineup limited to this number for now. And talking about, I, he, he mentioned that at some point, you know, maybe when you get to six players on a team or more after that, it seems unnecessary that it kind of dilutes the team, it dilutes the focus. What do you think about this? You know, what's, what's an ideal format for team size and Hearthstone? Because I'll give you some examples. For instance, uh, especially in Korea, uh, for StarCraft, right, you have kind of like the A-star lineups, and then you have their practice partners. And so any team could have anywhere from 5 to like 15 players for a 1v1 game. And then we have League of Legends, where a lot of Korean teams used to have two teams, and now with new formats, they still try to keep subs in, you know, two or more positions to allow practicing and possible rotations of rosters and pressuring each other to strive for the better results. What do you think about Hearthstone? I think everything depends on what you want the team, like who you want the team to practice with. Um, like for example, for our team, uh, like our whole thing is that we only practice within the team. And if you want, if you want to be able to do that, you need more players because everyone can't be on some days and stuff like that. Some people are traveling or whatever. Um, then you need like five, six players to, for that to even be possible because like like I said, everyone is not always on. But if you if you have other practice partners as well, three is definitely possible. If you let's say you have five other practice partners, then you're always gonna have those people to play with as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so kind of like what you said, is practice partners isn't completely team based. I know a bunch of teams that actually no one within their team practices with each other. But at the same time, when they're in the tournament, they're all represented by the same name. Meanwhile, there are some teams, I know uh, Powder IRQ, a lot of you guys practice with each other, swap decks all the time in training sessions. Um, and that also seems to work out. So I, I think for the size of a team, it doesn't really matter in terms of how many people you're going to practice with. 
but more so how much there, there's an interesting level where you, if the team can support that many players in terms of sending them to LAN events, keeping up the stream, working together, creating guides, then the more the merrier. But at the same time, let's say an organization of, uh, or, or an organizer of a tournament go, approaches a team and says, hey, can we have two of your players? If all of a sudden you have a team of 20 people, who do you pick to send? Some of the best players <laughs> could actually be like, I, I don't want to be a part of this as a backup player anymore, you know? Right. And, and that's what we've seen in Korea oftentimes with other titles is practice partners sometimes they're working in the team house for like three years on end and they never get the spotlight and so it's like at one point is it worth it to try to stick in this for kind of the big dream at the end but it may never happen and of course a lot of different regulations have put in place have been put in place in Korea now to count combat that uh, for Kespa teams but you know I think we'll see that develop a little bit more especially with Again, 1v1 title, StarCraft, uh, StarCraft 2, of course, now, and then Hearthstone, where some people may never get to shine. Now, and we talked about this last week a little bit, too, but we'll lead into team houses. But before we get to team houses, there is a concept of what do you guys think about teams and specifically having someone, uh, you know, that will have their income from the team and will be supported, but their pure purpose is as a practice partner, right? You're kind of the theory crafter, you're the guy who's going to help, help practice decks and tweak them a little bit. Do you think this is something we'll see, or it kind of just depends from team to team and person to person? Uh, it's hard to say. I don't know. I don't think Hearthstone is big enough right now for something like that to like, come in effect. I don't think most teams would want to have salary for another person. Like, it might, like, Players, I don't think a lot of players um, are being paid enough already. And then to have that another person come into a team where he would have to be paid a certain amount of money, um, I think we're a bit off from that. Like, StarCraft is already, like, a way established um, eSport, and there's a lot of money in Korea or uh, places like that where they yeah. actually can afford it easily and it actually helps out a lot. I think maybe if one team starts it and it becomes like a really big thing, then maybe we can see it in the future. But I don't think right now. Um, you, yeah, so it's just very difficult to make a real standard of living from this game right now, unless you have one of those major streams. Um, Profits alone from tournaments really is not enough to support really any lifestyle unless you're in Firebat's position where you win $100,000, which obviously <laughs> changed his life. Um, but the money does come from the streaming aspect, which takes a lot of time. I know Hosty, uh, who's actually now on Team Archon, he streamed for like eight months with no more than 100 viewers at a time. And the slowly, just one day at a time, built up a stream to still a respectable amount. If not for Archon, he still would have been in a position where he would not have been able to make a living, and that was eight months of streaming. So it's a, it's all about, really, for Hearthstone, I think, who you know, and getting a little bit lucky. Yeah, uh, obviously the game itself involves a little bit of luck here. Uh, and like you said, streaming, it, it takes a lot of commitment, and then you got to go for the long haul, right? And so... While a lot of us in the gaming community are very happy that streaming is now a big thing, you know, it's very widespread. It's, you know, it reminds me a lot of when YouTube first got big, right? It's everyone's like, oh, and like, now we can make livings off of making videos on YouTube. But it's still, even now, it's still kind of only the very top percent that's able to do that consistently. And, you know, if you want to get there now, perhaps it's even harder because there's so, such a saturation of content. Uh, for video content online and so now you have to kind of grind through that and same thing's happening with streaming where so many more people are doing it now so it's harder to try to last the battle out in the beginning and rise to the top uh, in terms of viewers and branding and we'll see we'll see who else is able to do that in hearthstone as we move forward uh now on that note again i wanted to jump into the concept of team houses we talked about this last week here on turn two also but uh, what do you guys think about team houses in Hearthstone? Do you think it really will have that much of a positive impact that every team is going to want to try to make it work if they can financially? Or 
you know, if not, you know, for instance, if you're a worldwide team, it's like, it's okay, you know, it's nice if you can have it, it's kind of convenient, but not going to really make a difference in the player results. I don't think it's necessary, um, but I think it will, it's beneficial, I would, I would definitely think so, because it's just easier um, to make sure everyone does what they're supposed to, it's easier for all the players to actually help each other to practice and just help everyone to actually do the practice because there's always going to be days where you're like oh, I'm feeling down today I don't want to practice and blah 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 but then you actually have someone like living with you that can cheer you up and just actually like get you to do what you're supposed to and uh, that's a lot easier if you're living together rather than if you're 500 miles away on on, the, on the internet. Um, for me, I guess, I don't know about you, Powder, but I cannot wait for the day to play a tournament and party at the Archon house. <laughs> yeah, I mean... <laughs> it's, it's more sounds, for... Sounds good to me. <laughs> I, I think the house situation is, one, in terms of logistics, would be kind of beneficial if you send your whole team to a tournament dream hack, then all you need to find is one flight out. Um... I know for a fact the team house in Texas, they chose because kind of the reduced price of living there compared to, let's say, L.A., where mm -hmm. some other teams are thinking about setting up. And then I know that they brought in Admirable, and I think even Kit Kats is going to be living in that house. So it's not really a team house. It's more, of a, more so a Hearthstone house. That way, like I said, they can host these tournaments, bring players there, really do production in one location. Um and then it's just a sharing a wealth of information. Hearthstone is not a... I really disagree in terms of the amount of practice that Hearthstone requires. It's a game about information, sharing ideas, um, kind of working out tactical strategies, and a lot of statistics involved, too, um, more so than actually playing. Um, I think for tournament preparation, you should spend... For every one hour you play the game you should probably spend two to three actually planning and preparing with spreadsheets statistical analysis determining the actual strategies and tactics to go into a tournament with bands and stuff so by, by having a group of players not only on this one team but from multiple teams including a caster you can really share strategies and uh get better preparation for future tournaments easier than you can over the internet very true and i actually like that you mentioned the concept of what a house can do more than just, you know, keeping the team together, right? If you make it a Hearthstone house, uh, this is how house cups happen. Uh, you know, the M house cup happens uh, for Hearthstone. You know, we, we've we had, you know, other other tournaments for, for instance, for uh, StarCraft, right? Tick TV has been doing that for a little bit while. So uh, this could allow, you know, different content to come about a little bit more and bring at least the players together. And then seeing their interaction can bring the community together in a fun way. Too. So I'm excited to see how that develops. I just wanted to get your thoughts uh, as we're seeing, we're hearing about teams, you know, including Archon, obviously, kind of in that spotlight, going for those team houses and seeing how they develop here for Hearthstone. Uh, at this point, I think we're going to take a quick break. Uh, we'll get some water and whatnot before we move on to part two of turn two. Uh, we'll discuss a little bit more. I want to touch upon some different parts about the esports scene and know how maybe people can get into it and then we'll talk just about some fun decks that have been popping up and wrap that up for today's episode so don't go anywhere we'll be back here chevra with dart and powder
Welcome back, everyone. Trevor here for turn two, episode number 42 with Dart and Powder. And during the break, we got to catch up a little bit more on the news that was just announced, of course, the 2015 Hearthstone World Championship. So we want to jump back a little bit to that because we didn't get to cover it too much. Um, but you know, during the break, we were talking and Dart, you were mentioning that now there's going to be a few more ways to be able to have a chance to qualify, right? We're looking at uh, community tournaments and fireside gatherings, uh, basically opening it up a little bit more to be accessible, I think. Uh, what do you think about that? And, you know, maybe some details that have come to light uh, as you're catching up on the news here. Um, so I, th I think the major point to take away from the news is it's no longer top 16 legend that automatically qualifies. Um, I mm -hmm. think one of the reasons Blizzard do that was because a lot of feedback, and excuse my language, but of the old clusterfuck that was legend the last day of the season, when it was um, hundreds <laughs> of players just shooting for that top 16. I remember I was actually, I was ranked two legend. 24 hours later, I was ranked 30. It, it's mm -hmm. unbelievable how much like the ladder moves in the last little bit. So I think, uh, I think Blizzard realized like how much of a kind of less so skill difference in the top 16 it used to be versus kind of getting lucky in the last day so now with the new point system it's every single season you gain a certain amount of points depending on what rank you are if you're ranked 20 you get 80 points if you're ranked one you get 100 and it's the top 24 players overall throughout the months that will be able to enter the world championship tournament which for me i think that's a great uh, great move in the right direction absolutely what about you powder uh i uh i mean it's kind of weird. I don't know if it's like they will only be those 24 people or like if there's going to be other ways to qualify as well. Because say you can't actually play one month and then you actually lose a lot of points because you're not able to and it's like, I don't know how many months this is going to cover. It's, it's a long time where you actually have to like actually play. You have to be top legend every season for it to be 20, top 24 because everyone's going to be going for it. Everyone that knows how to ladder proficiently is going to be aiming for, say, top 20 legend each season. And it's going to be really, really hard to get it. So yeah, it's going to be so... interesting. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to just see the, the final, like, small... Uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, details to the, mm. to the whole thing. Yeah, you know, as as you guys were talking about it, especially Dart, as you mentioned, kind of what the old system brought about with, you know, if you put a hard number on it, top 16, then the last few days, it's a scramble. And we see this in any game, right? If you put kind of a deadline, it's like, we got to reach this rank by then. Suddenly the last day, like everyone needs to be up 24 hours playing the game because otherwise you can, like you could lose your rank by not playing, right? Because if enough mm -hmm. people play, they'll overtake you eventually with their uh, rating. Now, uh, you know, you were talking about kind of, uh, powder your concern with well how much time does this encompass you know if someone can't play for one month is that going to be a big issue now we're looking at you know it's going to go until july and what i do like though is there it does sound like they're trying to mitigate as much of what you mentioned dart uh, because right you can earn points and if you have a minimum of two points which it doesn't sound like it'll be too hard to achieve right if you're consistently doing well on ladder or online tournaments uh, by the end of July, you can join the last call tournament, which sounds like it's going to be for the last spot for the regional qualifiers. Mm -hmm. But from there, the people with the most points, uh, the 23 players with the most points, will automatically get seeded into the qualifier. And then it sounds like one player uh, will be, oh no, a 40 player double elimination tournament. So way, way more players will also have chances to play in the regional qualifiers through the last call. So this way, it's not also like a hard set number of points you need to qualify for the qualifier uh, meaning that you know if you have enough points you can be like well i can't play this month but i can play in the last call tournament if i keep up keep this up and so then you know because i have a minimum of two points so the last call tournament could technically i guess be a huge pool uh that it feeds into the regional qualifier what do you think about mm -hmm. that kind of being put in place uh, as a buffer so i, I like I mean, the last call oh go ahead Potter. no you, you can go ahead <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I, I like how they did the last call last, the this previous Blizzard World Championship, 
mm-hmm. where it was a tournament of anyone who has reached top 100 legend, which seems to be the similar thing. It's right. you place, I think, so you have to place top 98 legend one time in the next eight months in order to get into it, which is going to be a lot of people. And it's for those people who maybe have just missed the cut of being in the top, I guess, 24 overall seated. Um, which, again, I think is just kind of a great idea. It gives people another shot if they think they may have, like, someone who may have missed going, or someone who goes on vacation for three months mm-hmm. and you just can't play Hearthstone. It just gives them another shot to actually get into this tournament. Yep. All right. Now, uh, another interesting thing is, of course, Fireside Gathering will host Blizzard sanctioned Hearthstone tournament. Um, now, this sounds like, in part, it's to also encourage Fireside Gatherings to continue to be a thing. Because when they were first announced, right, everyone was like, oh, this is really cool. Then you, you could get the card back, so people were really into it. And then maybe only set organizations, especially, obviously, campuses, uh, you know, college or uh, institution campuses, kind of started hosting them. But otherwise, people were like, oh, like... You know, Fireside Gatherings, I'm not sure if one's even happening in my region. I, I'm not really too up for setting something up. Uh, what do you think about making that kind of another portion of the esports scene, too, to entice people to join in more Fireside Gatherings? I mean, I I actually have uh, a local Fireside Gathering uh, pretty close to where I live, and I have never actually gone. So, <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, I mean... <laughs> In that aspect, I mean, I think fireside gatherings are a great way to meet people uh, that also play Hearthstone. I mean, it's a great way to meet new people and actually talk about something that all, you all uh, are doing and enjoying and stuff like that. So, I mean, fireside gatherings are, I think, just positive for the game and for the community as well. So, I think it's good. Um. Yeah, I do like the idea of fire, fireside gatherings because for me, I actually know almost no one person that plays Hearthstone. Um, mm. The only issue is when I came back, like when I used to live in Tennessee, there were no fireside gatherings around. So I think it gives a kind of a disadvantage to people depending on where you live. Meanwhile, now that I'm in Los Angeles, there will be fireside gatherings everywhere. Um, <laughs> the only issue is the one certain place that does host fireside gatherings will send at like 8 p.m. on a Saturday night. That's a terrible idea. I, I'm not gonna lie. I don't want to play Hearthstone that late on a Saturday. But if it's a way to get into the Blue World Championship, I guess I'll go once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and I think that's part of the point here, right? Is to uh, bring that up. Now, um, I do want to uh, talk about now. Now that we've discussed the World Championship a little bit more in detail what it takes to enter the esports scene now i i want to bring this up because of a couple points earlier of course dart you mentioned how you know it's hard for you to stream just because of time commitments that it takes to stream a while having another commitment on the side and last year uh for korea we had a lot of players who were just you know kind of your quote-unquote average joes or you know your students uh, whether mm-hmm. they're college students or grad school students, even uh, some high school students going into the qualifiers. And they're just like, oh, well, you know what? I, I just play this game in passing because it's quick. You know, I can just get on my computer and play or go to a PC cafe. And then, you know, there's an open qualifier, so why not? And then some of them actually made it through to the, of course, OGN tournament. And then we saw Kranish going to the World Championship and going up uh, to, you know, quite quite a high placing, which was very unexpected for anyone. And, and so what do you think about the time commitment it takes uh, to become, quote-unquote, a professional-level player in Hearthstone? Because other esports would argue that it needs to be a full-time job at all times. I mean, I think Hearthstone for sure is one of the easiest com- like competitive um, games you can actually like get to a, a very, very high level of. Hearthstone doesn't require, like, an extremely high uh, skill to actually, like, win tournaments and stuff like that, which is both good and bad. It's good for the players that are um, kind of not in the... not not pros, if you want to put it like that. Like, everyone has a chance to win, and that's that's kind of one of the things that makes Hearthstone <laughs> so exciting for many people. Mm-hmm. That you can you can beat anyone on a certain day and 
if you run really hard in one tournament, you can take it down. And uh, that's just the way it is. Uh, yeah, I completely agree with everything Powder just said. It's You have people who have crazy streaks of luck or skill even and take down a few tournaments without any like mistakes. And then you could have just a string of a few matches where you do ab absolutely terrible. Um, that's, I think, is one of the major issues of, I know a lot of teams and sponsors use the Gosu Gamers ranking um, as a big factor. But even if you're rank one in Gosu Gamers and lose two matches in a row, the amount that you drop, you'll drop 50, 60 ranks just for maybe getting unlucky in the final game due to RNG <laughs> of two times in a row. So if it comes down to two 50-50 chances, do you deserve to go from the rank one in the world to not even on the front page, top 50. Um, so I, I'm, I'm glad that Ghost of Gamers does have their ranking system and they do track all the tournaments, but it can get a little out of hand with how fluctuating those ranks are. I also yeah. do think that, uh, I mean, Hearthstone, uh, I kind of, I knew I was going to say it, now I just kind of lost it, but... <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, you, you can you can come back to this because we're going to stay on topic if, if it comes back to you. Um, okay. Now, so you guys are mentioning that maybe, you know, it's not as high, you know, of a ramped up skill cap uh, for Hearthstone compared to other titles. Uh, one thing I want to bring up is, do you think a huge part of it, and personally I think yes, is that it doesn't require like actual mechanics, right? Physical mechanics I'm talking about, for instance, micro basically, for StarCraft, uh, League of Legends, things like that, where you need micro, which the Korean way to do it, of course, we've seen time and time again, is that you just practice for hours on end so that it becomes mm -hmm. habitual for you. You just do it without thinking. And that's why a lot of Koreans will see consistent uh, rankings go up in worldwide tournaments. But in Hearthstone, you don't necessarily need that. Of course, the more you play, you'll kind of see the obvious plays earlier, but it, you don't have to kind of read it into your hand so that it just does it automatically. Do you think that allows Hearthstone to be a lot more accessible at a professional level? I definitely think so. Um, I mean, Hearthstone is like, everyone has the same... Uh, we all start out this, at the same point mm. in, in, in this game. I mean, and it's not something you can actually, like, you can't get better at selecting a certain card. Like, everyone can click on a card and place it on the, on the <laughs> screen. Like, you... <laughs> All you, it's it's everything's in your in your head. Like that's how you play Hearthstone. That's how you get better. And that might be a, like some people might just be better at card games than other people. They they're smarter in different ways. And that's another thing that it might be harder in Hearthstone to become extremely extremely good because you might have to have something like you you have to think in a certain way. And some people mm -hmm. might not be able to do that. And then they might actually not be able to become amazing at Hearthstone. Um, but in a game like Counter-Strike or a game like StarCraft, where you can practice, 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 um, you might not find like a barrier like that. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it is like this. It might be. But... <laughs> yeah, my, my favorite part about Hearthstone, I think, is the people that play it to an exceptional level you have to be intelligent. There are just some people, it's not like a game that you can just go into, practice for 12 hours a day, seven days a week, and become a pro. You need a certain level of intelligence and ingenuity just as a baseline that makes it to the professional scene of Hearthstone it is one of the most social I've ever met. All of them can hold up a conversation. Um, when I went to BlizzCon, I expected it to be stereotypical Comic-Con type people, but everyone I met that played Hearthstone was fun um i just i became friends with everyone there and it's just this the the baseline intelligence that you need to get to make it just makes it so the community just kind of grows as a whole just for the better all right now and i kind of want to pick at what you just said a little bit dart so of course for other titles do you think then just because the nature of the game leads to you perhaps having to spend so much time just physically practicing the game that it's you know that it's maybe harder for players to connect even with each other let alone with the fans 
Um, I don't, I don't have that much experience myself, but just mm. from what I saw being at BlizzCon, it seemed like the fans of the different games, it was just a completely different community. The World of Warcraft people reminded me of the StarCraft people. Meanwhile, you go to Hearthstone, and then you have people like having intelligent, just you see people having the most intelligent conversation that you're like, this is a video game convention. What is going on? Um, <laughs> I've met people from MIT, Harvard, uh, Stanford, some of the top colleges in the country. And I'm sure people uh, in England, so like Cambridge, uh, they're there too. But it, it's it's amazing the level of the people who play this game is really what I have to say. I think the professional players in Hearthstone would be successful without this game. Hmm. No, I, I will say personally, my experience has been that um, perhaps I've talked about a more diverse pool of topics. Yeah. With Hearthstone people uh, that mm -hmm. I've met, right. Whether it's politics, whether it's history, uh, whether it's nature, uh, granted, mm -hmm. I've had some very interesting conversations with other gamers too, oh, uh, but sure. I think it's it, it leads to it a little bit easier. I think is what we're both saying is that uh, perhaps there's just a better chance that you're going to reach these diverse topics when you talk because again, you you just physically do have more time uh, compared to say a StarCraft professional who's going to be mm -hmm. sitting in the team house practicing for eight hours a day and then just trying to make sure he sleeps the same amount of hours. Uh, so. Yeah, I think I think it's interesting. I think uh, the Hearthstone community in and of itself is definitely wonderful. Uh, like you said, at BlizzCon, I love the crowd. Uh, they were very reactive to the plays, but in an interesting way. Because again, there's no micro, there's no like big plays coming from your physical skill, right? It's just kind of your thought mm -hmm. and your theory going in. So exactly, it's and nice instead to of see practicing people. getting that micro exactly correct, you can have a conversation with someone, read the newspaper, and use that as a break. And honestly. Um, uh, like I said before, it's, I think practicing 10 hours a day is more harmful at Hearthstone than it is helpful. You, you need mm. to give your mind a break. I'm sure anyone who's ever taken a long exam comes out afterward and is just exhausted. Hearthstone's kind of the same way. Very true. Now, uh, that's all I kind of had for esports this week coming in. And uh, unless you guys wanted to maybe bring something up that you thought was interesting that's happened uh, recently with uh, any players or tournament results, uh, you can let me know. But if not, we'll jump right into kind of rounding things out on this episode, just talking about fun decks that have come up in GBG so far. And if we think these can be viable for any any sense of a competitive setting. Uh, you know, a couple of decks that come to mind, of course, are Hobgoblin Druids, which we actually saw Reynad uh, bring out in Deck Wars a couple weeks back. And then also one thing I want to note is, of course, the Pirate deck, right? Uh, the Pirate Road deck that Zixo got, you know, up to the Legend with, and then, you know, other people have been kind of promoting it after they saw Zixo and they talked to him about it. What do you think about these thematic decks having a place in a competitive setting do you think it's viable it definitely seems a little bit more viable than it was pre-gbg i'll say that I, I think you can always catch your opponent off guard with decks like this and that's <laughs> never a bad idea um it can always end up like you never know what's gonna happen in the in hearthstone and if you bring out a pirate deck and they're not prepared of course you can you can win a few games with it and uh I mean, I wouldn't say that the decks are as finely tuned as some of the normal decks we tend to see, like Hunter or Paladin or stuff like that, which actually pretty regularly take down more than one game in a series. Um, but I, I, I always think that fun decks are always great in tournaments as well. So what about you, Dart? Um... So I think kind of techie decks like that with Hobgoblin or some of the weird mages we've seen recently mm. um, fit more into a tournament style like Deck Wars, where you're playing against one person and then you're done. So that surprise element is huge, where you could throw them off guard, steal a game with it, even if you lose the game, like the next game. Just taking how kind of the current format works is if every one of your decks wins one game, you win the match. So if you can steal one game off a surprise, that's fantastic. The issue with when you have longer tournaments where you have like a bracket style or even Swiss, um, it's no longer a surprise. People see that you're playing this, that you prepare for it. So it's not as effective in the longer tournaments, I don't think. 
Yeah, we saw that at BlizzCon last year, right? Where Kranish brought out, of course, uh, the Worgen Warrior, and it caught Kalento off guard. But then, <laughs> right at you know the next match, right after, it's like, well, you know, now I know, you know, Tiller Celestial is like, I know what's coming up in this Warrior deck. I know how to counter it. It's pretty straightforward, uh, etc. And, oh yeah, and when uh, uh, Nymph used Elite Torn Chief in, <laughs> in uh, what tournament was that? Um, I don't. Was it was it IEM? I think so. I'm not positive, but it it made a huge splash, right? Because using ETC at all in, in any tournament is gonna it's gonna yeah, that, be, that was just gonna fantastic be hard. when he pulled that off. Yeah. So so like like you guys said, the element of surprise I think is there, but I I like what you said, Dart, that it's perhaps geared more towards these uh, kind of one-off matches that can feed into bigger tournaments um or you know ladder style tournaments like the ESL legendary series where you know you'll you'll just kind of set down your decks from the get-go and then that way you'll also have that amount of surprise from which deck order you chose um are there any other cards that you guys have kind of wanted to make work in tech wise specifically you know built around that card we talked about this a little bit in the early side of the episode but now that we're talking specifically about Hobgoblin and Pirates, um, anything else that you guys have, you know, even if you haven't tested that you've wanted to make work, maybe a call to the viewers here, like, hey, you know, I don't have the time to do this, but maybe you should go check it out. <laughs> hmm. uh, like, I'll, I'll start. Personally, you know, I really want to see Shadow Boxers become a more common thing in Prius. I think I'm a little bit far-fetched in my hope for that, but... I'd love to see it personally, just because I, I love the concept of the card, uh, the animation and whatnot. But I have personally, I haven't been able to make it work. I'll just put that out there, and I don't even want to put a call out for it because it's like building a deck around that card is not even sensible. I think you know, just including it in decks is one thing, but that's a tough one. I mean, it's not a GVG card, but Alarmabot is always gonna be in my. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. A very fun card. But I've oh. never actually like made it work, so my absolute favorite card is Ancestral uh Ancestral's Call. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Ancestral's Call, yeah. To find a deck that can take advantage of that would be unbelievable. I mean like imagine if that card was in any other like class. If you put that card in warrior or warlock even it becomes severely overpowered so i'm just hoping in the future shaman gets a few cards that make it a more kind of a viable deck archetype maybe uh we definitely saw you know people talking about it when it first came out and trying using that with farsight to get maybe kind of a mini ramp ish style a shaman thing going on uh we've mm -hmm. definitely seen some funny clips when people have used it in the first couple of weeks of gvg but yeah i think i think there's definitely still room to find some creativity uh with the gvg cards coming out and you know as we go on with 2015 again very excited for the world championship already being announced in the format and whatnot so people can look forward to that kind of plan their year out if you're already a professional if not kind of plan your year out to see how you can get into it uh, but that i think you know it's we're going to keep it a little bit short this week and not it's been a relatively quiet week for Hearthstone in the past couple of days. So that's all I've got for episode 42 on turn two. Thank you once again to Dart and Powder. If you guys want to take some time right now to give some shout outs before we wrap up the show, that'd be great. Um, I just a shout out to you and uh, Simpatico for putting this on. Thank you for inviting me. It was great to be on. Um, otherwise, I'm pretty much a loner. So shout out to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay um i mean yeah just thank you um shobra for having me here and simpatico as well um shout out to i heard you shout out to our sponsors um waypoint media kingwin um nerd z um yeah you can follow me at it's on the screen. RSU Powder and Powder HS. And yeah, that's basically it. Awesome. Awesome. Look forward to seeing more from you guys in 2015. And Hearthstone, of course, for me, as always, you guys can find me uh, right below my camera here on different social media. 
uh, all will show up, so you'll be able to see what I'm up to there. Thank you to all our viewers, of course, uh, for coming in and watching, and thank you to IRTU.com and Machinima for continuing to host this awesome show. We'll be back next week with more talk about Hearthstone. Thanks for tuning in.